Good evening all, and welcome to tonight's Ouija board session. Thankfully, to help us along, we have Blue Spooky here too, who I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. He is an incredibly talented narrator, and if you didn't know this by now, you'll find out by the end. The link to his channel can be found in the description of this video, as well as at the end in the little cards. In any case, it's time to get comfortable, get your planchette ready, and let the darkness take control. In 1996, when my mum was six months pregnant with me, she decided that she wanted to play the Ouija board with her sister. My grandmother died about three months beforehand, and they wanted to see if they could contact her. My mum and aunt say that they had talked to what they thought was their mother, who tragically died in that house three months prior. They spoke for about 30 minutes, until the planchette made a sharp movement and the air went ice cold. The planchette was moving very fast on the board, as it kept repeating, mine, mine, mine. This really scared my mum, so they stopped the session. A few weeks later, my mum goes into labour. At the time, this scared my mum, because I was a month and a few weeks early. When I was born, I was so small that I had to stay in the hospital for two more weeks. All was well when my mum and I left. Fast forward to when I was four, I started getting horrible night terrors of me sitting on the top of the stairs in my house. In the dream, you could tell that it was daytime, but it was still dark. My feet were stuck to the floor like it was quicksand, and I would scream and scream for what felt like hours, and at the end of the dream I would always be able to see something crawling up me slowly. It was very skinny, long-limbed, this black creature with extremely long fingers and darker fingernails that were even longer. His eyes were a big, burning red. I would get this dream so often, that when this creature would start to appear, I would be able to wake myself up. These dreams were quite an often occurrence, almost every night. I told my mum about it, and she told me that I shouldn't stay up late and scare myself with stories. My mum's attitude definitely started to change when my little sister started saying creepy things. At this time, my sister was two and a half years old, and very smart. One night, my sister and I were in my room getting tucked in at the end of the night, and every night my sister and mum played a little game before bed. My mum would tell my sister to spell a word, and my sister would spell it, and she would get a prize. As my mum said goodnight to us, my sister says, Mummy, can you spell black man? Better run. She said this in the most sing-song horror movie kind of way. That night I woke up to something very odd. An old lady at the end of my bed. Honestly, she looked so real, I thought a real old lady was in my room. I screamed, turned on the light and she wasn't there. Totally creeped out. I remember keeping the light on as I couldn't sleep in the dark anymore. It was too paralyzing. All of a sudden, I wake up in the darkness again. I didn't even remember closing my eyes to sleep. And there was that old woman at the edge of the bed. This time I knew she wasn't human. She had blue skin, rotting teeth. Her eyes were an unnatural blue and she was just staring at me smiling. Then she began to laugh. It started with a small giggle and then she started cackling. She laughed so hard that she threw her head back, acting like a mental patient. I was in such shock I couldn't even cry. My mouth was agape. And after a while, she was laughing so much her mouth was getting larger. It unhinged like that of a snake. And then suddenly, mid-laugh, she stops, snaps her head back, and in a very fast and low man's voice says, If you're scared, cover your head, little piggy because I'm not gonna stop. I did that right away. I covered my face in my blankets, and right away she began laughing again. I laid there for what felt like hours under my blankets, scared to death. Finally, I awoke. Daylight. Now after this happened, I told my mum, 
and she called my grandpa who was a pastor. He came over, blessed the house, and everything was okay for the most part. One thing happened after a while when I was a teenager. And after I got older, I moved downstairs and got my own bedroom, and my sister stayed upstairs. Every night without a doubt, I would always wake up at 4.30 a.m. I would hear creaking down my stairs, footsteps, and I would hear these footsteps all the way to my door to my room. Then my door would slowly open. No one would ever be there. And after a minute or two, it would slowly close. After my entire childhood of living there, we finally moved. I was 17 and had not noticed anything creepy besides the door in years. One night, my mum's sister and I were all on her bed watching TV. It was June, and that day we had horrible thunderstorms. The storms got so bad that the power went out, and we all decided to go to sleep because it was getting late anyway. Then all three of us wake up at the exact same time. It's still dark, and it's very cold considering the fact that it was summer and the AC was off. Then all three of us gasp as we see at least a seven foot tall figure right in the bedroom doorway. Suddenly, I hear that laugh that I'd heard so many years ago. I knew who it was. Then the creature whispers something to us, something that is burnt into my memory. I found you. My entire body was in shock. He found us, the black man. Then he vanished, like he was never there. Nothing happened after that for years. That is until I moved to Florida with my then boyfriend, now husband. My husband worked third shift, so I always found myself not being able to sleep at night. I went out one night around 1am to smoke a joint. I have a very small house with a small front yard. I was planning on smoking fast and running inside. As I finished my joint and started walking, I noticed a long black arm with black claws stretching down from the roof, like something was going to grab my hair. It was inhuman. I told my husband, and he responded that he was worried about my health. That is, until he saw the black thing on top of the roof. That was the other day. Can anyone tell me why he's on my roof? I'm just wondering when he's gonna try and come inside. Many years ago, as a 14-year-old, staying overnight at a friend's house with three other friends, similar ages. We'd all grown up together, except one, who was a cousin of the kid who lived there, and we'd never met him before. His older sister, 16 at the time, was the babysitter, while the parents were out for the evening. She decided to unearth a Ouija board from a cupboard somewhere, and thought it would be a laugh to scare a shitless. This was back in the days when you could buy Ouija boards as a board game from your local toy store. So, we all gather around, and she starts off with a kind of yes or no lie detector, directing questions to the each of us in turn. Cue some nervous giggles, but also a feeling of unease, as we all began to feel like this was awesomely amazing, like some kind of secret that we'd all been unaware of before. Shit gets strange when the sister asks out loud, If there's anyone here, please show yourself. A pause of a few moments, and then a framed picture falls off the wall and onto the floor. Naturally, we all freak the fuck out. She calms us down and insists we go back to the board, because we have to help whoever knocked the picture down. Ashen-faced and hearts pounding, we started asking questions, I should also add the pointer is moving smoothly and rapidly, in a completely different manner than before. Are you in the room? Pointer says yes. Are you a man? Pointer says no. Do you need help? Pointer says no again. What's your name? It spells out Sarah. Tell us a secret, we ask. The pointer spells out flip a coin. So we did. Someone leaves the table and gets a ten pence piece from out of the loose change jar in the kitchen. This was in the days when ten pence coins were big and clunky. The coin goes spinning up high in the air. As we watch it coming down, 
It stops spinning and serenely falls edge down to land on the table. When I say land, it didn't bounce. It didn't rock. It just came down and met the table, perfectly balanced on the edge, as if someone had reached out and gently placed it there. Breaking the silence, the pointer starts moving again, seemingly random letters. We soon begin to realize their initials, including middle names. Family tradition for my friend and his sister was to have three middle names, something not all of us knew. Aside from the brother and the cousin, no one else would have known the older sister's full name, and we'd met the cousin for the first time that night. Somehow, every person present had their initials spelled correctly out to them. The pointer pauses, and then spells out three last words. Children, stop, now. It took me many, many weeks to be able to sleep properly. No one told their parents, and over the years it became our collective shared secret. I couldn't rationalize it then, and I still can't rationalize it today. About a month ago, I was sitting at the lunch table with my six close friends, like any other day at school. Something was off that day because my friend, Amanda, looked kind of nervous. It wasn't long before she told me she was going to tell me something later. I told her it's okay, and she could tell me now. So she did. Back in late July, Amanda played the Ouija board with another friend of ours, and she was scared that I was going to be disappointed because we are Catholic. I told her it's okay, and that she can do what she wants and that I won't ever judge her. Anyway, Amanda asked me if I remembered when she played the Ouija board. I said, what about it? And she said she didn't really tell me what the ghost told her. She told me that they met a ghost called Nick that died of obesity. Amanda said he wasn't evil. So basically what happened was Nick told Amanda and my other friend that Amanda was going to die before she was 20. Amanda told me that he also said she was going to die because she was going to be thrown into a river by a close friend. I started to panic thinking this was me. I asked her who and she said that our other friend called Becca. I looked beside me and saw Becca talking to our other friends and not paying any attention to us. I was scared. I asked if she was lying, and she says she swears that she's telling the truth, and that she will put her hand on the Bible and say she isn't lying. I asked if she, or any of our other friends, were moving the planchette, and she says no, as they promised not to move it before they played. I always told her not to mess around with ghosts or Ouija boards, and I feel scared. I would also like to add that the other friend that played confirmed this story. I just don't know what to think of it. I thought Ouija boards and all that were fake, but this experience changed my mind. Me and my friend, who I'll just call Allie, decided to mess around with a Ouija board for some fun. Neither of us actually owned one, so we just made one out of paper. As you can imagine, it didn't look so good, but it wasn't terrible. We also somehow crumpled it up, but I don't remember how. At first, nothing was happening. Both of us were laughing and spelling out fake things on the board. After laughing for a bit more, though, we actually got serious. It took a few tries, but something actually started talking to us. It was moving a bit slow at first, but got faster and faster. We both thought the other was moving it. We asked if it could give us a name, and it went to yes, but didn't spell anything out. We asked if it was human, and it said yes. We asked when they were born, and it went to the four. My friend asked BC or AD and it said BC. We both thought that was weird, but moved on. We asked if he knew who Castiel was. I watched Supernatural, so it was kind of just a joke. The board said yes. I asked if they knew any other angels, and it said yes again. We then asked what they were again, and the board spelled out angel. We asked what their name was again, 
and it spelled out a Noah. I asked if it watched me, and it said yes, so I asked if it was a guardian angel. The board said no. It didn't want to go all the way to the no across the board, so we just said to use the blank space as no. My mom walked in at some point, so we had to hide the board away because I don't think she would like me playing with it. She probably knew something was up, because we were both acting super suspicious, but she decided to ignore it. She then said she was leaving, so we were going to be all alone. We got the board back out again, and asked if it was still there. Immediately, it went to yes. At this point, we both knew it was a demon, so we asked it. It started spelling out Zozo, so we said goodbye. But since we were both dumb and desperate, we went back on. We told that it was okay that it was a demon, and we decided to continue talking. We asked if it was actually Zozo or not, and to go to D for a different demon. It went over to the D. We asked if Zozo was even real, and it basically said they couldn't say. We asked if demons have genders, and it pointed to yes and said it was a boy. After this, we started asking questions the other didn't know, like what our grandma's name was. I asked if either of us had connections to dead people. My friend said yes and asked the demon which one he wanted to talk about. They spelled out M, which was the first letter of her mom's best friend's name, who had died. Allie then asked how she'd died. The police didn't know if it was a murder or suicide. The board spelled out man. At the time, I didn't know the story, so she explained it to me. She then asked who it was, and it spelled out the girl's boyfriend. After that, my friend wanted to get off the topic, so of course, we did. I asked if it knew my uncle's name, which I forgot because he's been dead for a long time. It was one of those things where if I saw it, I'd know. It spelled out a C, and suddenly I remembered his name, which did start with a C. I asked if he knew what my grandpa's name was. It gave a T, which was also the first letter of my grandpa's name. I asked if he could tell me how he died, and it spelled out cancer. I then asked if he could give me the first letter of the type. It spelled out L. My grandpa had died of lung cancer. I asked if I was going to kill someone in the future, and the board said yes. I asked it for a name, and it spelled out my friend's name. I asked the board if it was joking, and once again it said yes. We kept joking around with him, like I asked if he was Satan. I said, are you sure about that? And he said no. I asked if Satan had better things to do and if he was a busy man. The board spelled out yes. We also got it to spell out gay. When we asked why he was watching us, he spelled out why not. He also said he didn't know what the internet or school was. He couldn't give us any actual details of our future and was mostly just messing with us. We asked if he liked us and liked talking to us, and he said yes. At some point, we asked if Satan created demons, and he said yes. We asked him about other demons, and he said he didn't like them and didn't talk to them. We asked him if he was lonely, and then it literally started to fly across the board. It seemed like a sensitive topic. It also seemed to be predicting questions before we asked. My dad rung the doorbell all of a sudden, so we said bye and my friend had to go. That was the end. We were talking to him for two hours. Was it dumb of us to continue talking to him even after he admitted he was a demon? Also, the only time I really felt weird was when he spelled out man. Was it even a demon at all? He was actually really chill and just going along with whatever we said. For all of those saying my friend was messing with me, it's possible, but honestly, she's a terrible liar. Strap on. This is going to be a long one. So after all of this happened, we talked to him again a week later. I don't really remember what happened during the conversation, but I'm pretty sure he mentioned he was now attached to me. 
I didn't really care though, because nothing bad happened. We talked to Anoa a few times before something really weird happened. He was acting strangely, so we asked the board if it was a different demon. It said yes. Cue basically the same combo that happened with Anoa originally. He admitted to being a demon, and said his name was Mazam. He joked around more than Anoa, but was a bit more aggressive. They both ended up being attached to me instead of my friend, probably because I had more of an open energy. Anoa and Mazam didn't like each other very much, and argued a lot over who got to talk to us. The first time we talked to Mazam, he started spelling something out, so we stopped him and asked if it was important. He said yes, so we started to write down what he was spelling. He spelled out my first name and wrote sad. We both were a bit freaked out and asked if we could look up his name. We knew Mazam wasn't the real name, but we just wanted something to call it by. We found a YouTube video. The video is kind of cringy, but ignore that. If you don't want to watch it, this is why it freaked us out so bad. The video mentioned being sad, and Mazam had spelled out sad. I get that it sounds kind of stupid and could just be a coincidence, but it still freaked us the fuck out. For people thinking my friend knew about the video and just wanted to freak me out, honestly, she believes in this stuff way more than I do, and she was way more freaked out about this. She wanted to stop, but we continued anyway. Nothing really important happened after that. Later, we talked to them again in my living room. They were switching between who talked and started arguing. They suddenly stopped talking, so we left. A week later, we tried talking to them in my room, but they didn't come. Instead, we got someone else. They said they were an incubus and give a fake name, but I can't remember it. We ended up going to the living room in hopes Mazam and Anoa were still there. They were. Long story short, they said they were both still fighting but managed to kill the Incubus. We were kind of upset but didn't really care. I went to Universal and asked if they went with me. They said yes and that they enjoyed it. I asked what Mazam's favorite ride was and he said the Hulk. He said they were riding along beside me. Now get ready for the twist. We got on the board one day and it didn't sound like either of them. So we asked who it was. They said their name was Dominic. We talked to him and asked if we could have Mazam or Anoa, and at one point he just left. Mazam came on the board, so we asked if he killed Dominic and what he was. Mazam said he was an angel, and that Anoa was fighting him right now. We left so Mazam could also fight him. When we came back, Mazam talked to us. He was moving really slowly even though normally he moves fast. We asked if Anoa was okay. He said no. We asked if he was dead. He stopped moving for a moment and hesitantly went to yes. He said he was going to be next, and we weren't going to see him again. That was the last time we heard from either of them. Dominic then talked to us. We still had our doubts and didn't believe Dominic was actually an angel. Other demons claimed they were angels. So why should we believe this one? It made him really angry we didn't believe him. We asked if he killed Mazam and Anoa, and he said he did. I then met a joke comparing demons to cockroaches. My friend said to send a sign if he was an angel, and he agreed. Nothing else happened, so we left. Immediately afterwards, we walked outside, because I heard an owl. As soon as I stepped onto the porch... We were greeted with a dead cockroach. We continued, and there was indeed an owl in the tree. My friend looked it up, and in some cultures, owls are death omens. We believed him after that. We talked to Dominic a week later. He was still angry at us, although we apologized and said we believed him. We talked to him for a bit and asked about our futures. He said we have different pathways and he can't say exactly what will happen. He did give some information about my friend's dad, though. We're not exactly sure if it's true, because my friend doesn't even know what happened. At one point, he also said Mazam and Anoa were high-level demons. 
He said he was going to watch over us and kill any demons that came near us. We asked a lot of questions he couldn't answer. I'm assuming there's just some things they can't say, considering the demons did the same thing. He talked to us a few times after that, but not for long because he hates us. Soon after that, when we tried to talk to Dominic, some rude-ass demon came on instead. Whenever we asked for his name, he said DP, and he wouldn't answer any of our questions. At one point, he spelled out Omen. Dominic came on for a minute and just left. Like I said, he hated us. We went for a walk later and saw a dead bird whose guts were ripped out. Do you think the dead duck is related to the demon? This story takes place in the year 1993. I was a sophomore in high school. I must emphasize the importance of the year, as cell phones, internet, and effortless forms of mass communication at your fingertips were non-existent. There is ample amount of backstory. At this time in my life, my friends and I were very carelessly using a Ouija board that I found in my deceased great uncle's attic after he passed. Again, I won't go into details here, other than it was a wooden board, old, and had no instructions. We took it home, and my sisters and I, along with my friend, began to play with it. Weeks went by, a few months went by, and lots of weird stuff was happening in the house with my friends. I am a strong believer in the paranormal, and didn't question much of what was happening, as it was witnessed not by just me, but many others. I saw such occurrences change the belief of staunch skeptics in a matter of moments. I was terrified most of the time, sleeping with my lights on, and never alone. At times, I was even amused by it. Then came a day in early spring of 1993, that my friends and I were sitting at around a table in the library of our high school. The topic always seemed to circle back around to what was happening at my house. There were four of us sitting at the table, myself, Monica, Kim, and Suzanne. I was beginning to get a little agitated and began to feel arrogant. So arrogant that I said aloud to my friends almost these exact words, if you're so powerful and so real, then you wouldn't be stuck at my house. So show us a sign you can hear us from beyond the board. And just like that, all the lights off in the entire library went out for an entire five seconds. When they came back, I continued my overconfident banter by laughing and saying, really, that's all you have. The bell rang shortly after, and it was time to go home. I didn't think too much of the incident after, but I knew my fake egotistical act may have some consequences down the line. That night when I fell asleep, I had a dream. This was one of those dreams or visions, if you may, that you wake from and feel it. You can recite every line and detail of it. To this day, I can still feel the resonation and remember it. The dream starts off in the morning, as I began to walk to school from the street. I am then plagued with a sense of terror and a sense that I was slowly being chased. There was a procession of black hooded figures, fully cloaked, with no signs of human life underneath, just a human form. There were six of them, all with their heads down. It was broad daylight, and they were each carrying a torch. In the middle of them was a very tall figure, again all in black, with a red stripe down the front of his cloak. He was not carrying a torch, but rather a long pewter staff. This is when I stopped studying the details of who this was. I knew who it was, and I knew they were after me. Especially him. They were not running or in any type of haste. The procession was slow and methodical. I ran in the school fast, and frantically began to look for a spot to hide in the library, as that was where my dreams put me. I jumped over these bookshelves, which were low to the ground, both in the dream world and real world, and balled up on a shelf, hiding and praying not to be found. That's when I awoke, breathless. I said a few words as I got ready for school, and on the bus that morning. 
None of my friends involved in the library situation or the Ouija stuff in general were on the same bus route, and I dared not speak a word of it to the kids I rode the bus with, as most of them I despised. When I arrived at school, finding my friends Monica and Kim waiting for me at the north entrance, as they did every morning, and I began to detail my dream to them. We had entered the main hallway as I finished recounting the dream, when running from the south entrance, which was a pretty good distance from us was Suzanne. I do not feel I need to drive home the point, that there were no cell phones and no conceivable ways of Suzanne getting any of this information. This is exactly as it happened and is 100% accurate. Trying as hard as she could to catch her breath, she looked at me and said, I have a message for you. Him. Tell Nicole she can run, but she can't hide. To this day, every time I tell this story, I envision him laughing still and saying, I found I'm extremely skeptical about the paranormal, but this experience kind of blew my mind, so I thought I'd share it. I used to live in a building that had eight separate flats in it. I didn't interact much with the other people in the building, except for the guy who lived next door to me, one of the nicest guys I've ever met, and the guy who lived directly below me. I immediately noticed when I moved in that the guy below me was the opposite of a considerate neighbor. He blasted music at all hours of the night, sometimes for 24 hours straight. Honestly though, I could sleep through a hurricane, and it genuinely didn't bother me that much, except for the fact that it was super rude. Anyway, I opted to keep the peace and not mention it. The guy who lived next door to me, Gary, approached me one day asking if I was okay about the guy below me playing his music so loud, because even Gary could hear it in his flat. I told him I wasn't too bothered by it, and Gary said he was relieved because he didn't want me confronting that guy on my own. I'm a 20 year old girl and Gary was about 50, so I think he was just looking out for me. I asked why and he said that he'd met the guy years beforehand through work, and he'd introduced himself as John, but when he moved into the flat he introduced himself as Wes. Gary had gone back to one of the other guys who'd worked with them to double check and he said he'd switch between the two personalities regularly. He obviously had some form of personality disorder. I'm hardly an expert on things like that, but I'd hear Wes, that's the name my boyfriend and I ended up using to refer to him, yelling quite a lot. I wondered if maybe he played the music to drown out the voices in his head or something. I might be way off the mark. Like I said, I'm not an expert. Anyway... One day, I find a note taped to my door. Stop your constant banging. I can't sleep. You can tell from the handwriting that it's been scrawled in a fury. Now, I was at work 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and when I got home, I pretty much sat on my sofa all night. Obviously, I made tea and went to the bathroom, too, but I definitely wasn't constantly banging. Anyway, Wes took it upon himself to start banging on his roof, whenever he felt like I was being too loud, and that's how I know it wasn't me. He'd bang at the most random times, when I hadn't even moved from the sofa for over an hour, and sometimes at about 4am when I'd been to bed for ages. My boyfriend knocked on his door a few times, but he never answered. This is where it gets creepy. I don't necessarily believe in ghosts, to be completely honest so I never thought much of the weird noises I heard in that flat. I was living in a building with seven other people after all. In hindsight, my boyfriend said some weird things in his sleep too, but he sleep talks random nonsense regularly anyway. Despite me not believing in ghosts, I do find it super interesting, and I have a Ouija board which I occasionally try out. One time, my boyfriend and I decided to use it, We'd already used it once before in that flat, but nothing happened. This time, however, something did. Mostly, it was moving to random letters that just made no sense. But I was feeling a weird vibe. The candles kept flickering, which I know sounds really weak, 
but I just had a really weird feeling about the situation for some reason. Anyway, the board then says, F-I-N-D-M-E. Naturally, I ask, where are you? It spells out, W-E-S-H-I-D-B-O-D-Y. Like an absolute idiot, I read that as Weshid Body and hastily concluded that the board was talking nonsense. I said goodbye and turned the lights on. To be honest, I was getting really freaked out. I thought I could hear things moving around, and I didn't want my boyfriend to see how creeped out I was. He believes in ghosts, and I'm always super skeptical about it. Only after I sat down on the sofa did I realize it had actually been saying, Wes hid body. When the realization hit me, I told my boyfriend, whose reaction was along the lines of, Oh, I see, very funny. To this day, he thinks I was pushing the board, and played dumb to make it seem realistic. But I wasn't. Out of curiosity, I tried to look up local murders or disappearances, but I couldn't find anything. I also can't find any social media for Wes, or anything of interest about him online. I managed to find out his real name. I still don't know what happened or why the board said that. I'm convinced there must be a logical explanation. Subconscious movements, maybe. But it definitely freaked me the hell out. I moved out of that flat a couple months ago. I'm not gonna lie, I have not used the Ouija board since. I've never been into paranormal stuff, because I've had enough activity happen to me over the years. Over this last summer, my friends and I decided it was a good idea to make our own Ouija board, and play it at their house, and also at the cemetery. They asked it stuff that I knew was true and they did not. Right there I could sense it was a real thing. Then out of curiosity, my friend Karen goes, Will our friend Penny be pregnant at age 19? And it said yes. Fast forward a few months, and I get a phone call from Penny saying she's actually pregnant. And in that moment, I've never been so awestruck and freaked out at the same time. Nothing like that has ever worked. And now I'm a little more freaked out that I know the board worked. I cannot believe that it came true and that the board predicted something as insane like that. I kind of am excited about the other stuff we asked, but it was also very leery of it too. I've lived in a few houses growing up, and I used to play a lot of Ouija. I grew up with a mother who was totally into anything paranormal, so naturally it rubbed off on me. I'll share an experience I had when I was 18. One place we lived in was more of a cottage than a house. It was out in the country down a long dirt driveway, and it was like a main section of house with two bedrooms my room and my sister's room. Then it had two additional rooms added on, one on the side, my brother's, and one on the back of the house, which was of course my mom's. One night, my sister and I were playing with our homemade Ouija. We cut out every letter of the alphabet and arranged them in order, wrote yes, no, hello, and goodbye, and we would use a shot glass as our planchette. We made contact with a ghost who identified itself as Fred. I was using a pencil to jot down all the letters the glass was pointing to, when all of a sudden the pencil was just gone. I checked under the table and around the kitchen where we were sitting, and hadn't moved from since we started. I decided to ask the Ouija board where the pencil had gone. It responded by saying it was in my mom's room. Now, I was always afraid of her room. It always felt like something was watching you from the doorway. It was actually just at the end of the hall that was connected to the kitchen where we were sitting. The Ouija board spelled out, Go get it. I thought, Hell no, I'm not going in there. It started to spell out, Go, go, go. I asked why it wanted me to go in there so badly. The board spelt something along the lines of, Because I want to kill you. I didn't want to look like a wimp, so I said, 
Well, if you kill me, then you'll be stuck with me in the afterlife, and I'll mess with you for all of eternity. This was basically a provocation, something you should never do with spirits, unless you want some kind of backlash, of course, which I got. I'm not so sure Fred liked that, because we couldn't get the Ouija board to talk to us after that. The next morning, everyone left to go about their daily business, and I was at home alone, sleeping in, because it was my day off work. While I was still sleeping in my creepy-ass room with no windows, half in a dream but half aware of my surroundings, I could hear two people talking about blankets. I thought it was my mom and my sister. I heard them say, Take the blankets. He's sleeping. I felt my blankets get pulled off of me, which immediately woke me up. I opened my eyes and realized I couldn't move. I was stuck in sleep paralysis. I could no longer hear the voices. All I could do was move my eyes. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. Then out of the corner of my eyes, I saw something glowing. I moved my eyes to where I saw it, and there was a big, round, pale white face floating beside my bed and staring at me. I was so scared, I felt a tear come out of my eye. It was there, staring at me, while I stared back at it in terror for at least ten seconds. All the while, I'm freaking paralyzed. Then its black eyes just blinked, and it floated up into the corner of my room and disappeared. The second it was gone, I regained all of my motor functions. I snapped out of bed and just ran outside, to get out of the house. A couple of days later... I was up late watching TV in the living room, which was attached to my room, my brother's room, and my sister's room. They all had doors on opposite sides of the walls of the living room. While my mom was in a room sleeping and my siblings were all out, I'm just sitting there a little on edge because the house was extra scary, especially after that first experience. The next thing you know, I hear this loud crashing coming from my sister's room, which was right beside the chair I was sitting in. I jump up and scream, and run to the middle of the living room. I stare at my sister's door half expecting it to open, and some wild animal to come charging through and attack me. But nothing happened. Not five seconds later, I hear the same crash come from my brother's room. I ran to my mom's room to wake her up so I could make her check what the fuck was making all these banging sounds in the rooms. Not my proudest moment. I stood behind her while she opened my sister's door. I was thinking maybe a raccoon or something had gotten in there. We looked inside and realized that a few of the ceiling tiles were torn out from different sections of the ceiling and laying all around her room. One on the bed, two on the floor, all about five feet from one another. At this point, I said, Okay, it's a crappy house. Maybe an animal was up there and knocked them down. So what happened to my brother's plywood that was screwed onto the roof studs? The plywood somehow became detached and fell down. And what are the odds of two different sections of the house that were not attached to each other in any way, made up of two different building materials, on a rainless summer night, having their ceilings fall down? What other explanation could there be other than me thinking I'm being a badass by calling on a ghost, and within the next few days having these strange events happening? So I warn anyone who thinks they're tough or brave or whatever, don't tell a creepy ghost named Fred who said he wants to kill you that you met on a Ouija board you were playing in the middle of a creepy-ass house that you live out in the middle of the boonies, that you're going to mess with him for all of eternity, or you might just end up regretting it like I did. I was 16, and bored at my girlfriend's cousin's place. Thai people are a bunch of superstitious people. I'm only half, but my girlfriend, her cousin, and her friend are 100% Thai. We decide to make a Ouija board, just write letters and numbers on a piece of print paper. We decide to light candles and politely ask spirits to join us. Freaky how the coin we pushed around seemed to move so quickly and accurately, spelling out names of our future boyfriends and girlfriends. It was easy for me to blame Joey, the most excited of the bunch for manipulating the coin. 
we decided to put our Ouija to the test. My girlfriend volunteered to have the only finger on the coin, while the rest of us just touched her elbow. We also asked her to close her eyes and look up away from the board, and asked a couple of questions. After receiving no response, we asked our final question. Is anyone here? My girlfriend screamed and we jumped away to witness. We saw her crying as the coin spelled stop. Her eyes still closed, face towards the ceiling and tears running down her cheeks. It continued for 30 seconds and finally let her go. We tore the piece of paper up, flushed it down the toilet and sat stunned and speechless. My girlfriend said she had absolutely no control of her body and wanted to look down and jump away from the board, but she couldn't. I will never forget that night, and I've been convinced of the unknown ever since. I had just come home from my first summer of my freshman year of college. My parents were in the process of their divorce, and both decided to vacate the house and leave me alone. I was angry, confused. I felt abandoned by my own parents, and refused to talk to either one of them. I hated being alone in the house. I never liked being there alone, even when my parents were still together. Eventually, the foreclosure note appeared on the front door. My parents gave up on the house, and I felt like they gave up on me, too. With the short notice, I knew I wasn't going to have the money, so I decided on getting an apartment with my friends. There was about a two to three week waiting list, so we just stayed in the house leading up to moving into the apartment. They knew about some of my experiences in the house, and witnessed many things just for the short amount of time they had stayed there with me. Do not ever play with Ouija boards. That's what everyone always says. We didn't have the real thing, so we made one from a piece of cardboard and a little whiskey glass as the planchette. This was all a joke to them. They were just asking random questions and getting random responses. Nothing too scary or serious. They were laughing and making fun of the entire situation. Me, though. I felt uneasy the entire time. I knew what the house was capable of, and for some reason I knew it was holding back. They got bored easily and eventually stopped playing. I was somewhat relieved. We were sitting around in the kitchen when we heard something scraping on something coming from the living room. When we went to investigate, we saw the glass moving around on the board by itself fairly quickly. It was landing on different letters, but in a weird repetitive way. I can still hear the sound in my head. I can still hear the sound in my head. This was clearly terrifying and wasn't what or who we were previously making contact with. We grabbed a piece of paper and spelled out the words it was making. There are seven. At this point, most people would walk away, but we were all too intrigued. The house was starting to show its true nature. We positioned ourselves around the board and placed our fingers on the glass. I asked it, who or what is the seven? It spelled B-A-D and then spelled D-E-M-O-N-S. I then asked who we were speaking with, and it spelled out Gary. My friends didn't know it at this time, but I knew a Gary. I also knew that when he passed away, that he had requested his ashes be spread in our woods because he always loved to hunt and hike in them. This was done in a small private ceremony, and the only thing marking where it was done was a small concrete deer statue placed by a tree deep in the woods. My emotions were all over the place, and in that moment, I really felt as if Gary was speaking to us. The energy was insane, but there was a calmness in that moment. I had tears beginning to form when I asked Gary several more questions. In the course of these questions, 
we were able to determine that seven demons inhabited the land, inside the house and on the porch. We also learned that there were bad and good spirits, and that the bad trumped the good in numbers, but the good were stronger and kept me safe throughout my life. During this time, the board kind of switched gears, and we also made contact with a man named Heishman. He only gave us his last name. Heishman was a popular name in our town, and several Heishmans actually lived in the area. He told us he had died in a car accident, and gave us the cemetery, which was in town, that he was buried in. Apparently, he was one of the good spirits that helped me to keep the bad away. I was in disbelief, and very intrigued. I was getting answers that I had been searching for since I was a child. However, one of my friends wanted more. He so desperately wanted to speak with the bad spirits, he began taunting whatever and whoever was there. I urged him not to, because I knew what the house was capable of. I even took my fingers off the glass, because I didn't want my energy to mingle with whatever he was trying to contact. He told Gary and Heishman goodbye, and said he wanted to talk with one of the bad spirits. Clearly, he was not the smartest guy. He kept demanding a name with no response. Even after everything he had just witnessed, he wanted more proof. He had a cigarette and dared one of the spirits to roll it off the board. If the spirit did this, he would give them the lighter to smoke it. Again, just taunting the house to show him more proof. But it really happened. Not only did the cigarette roll off the board and onto the carpet, it rolled back up onto the board. This means it had to roll back over the lump separating the board from the carpet. We all immediately jumped back. Everyone's fingers shot off the glass. The energy in the house became thick. The house was alive. The lights began to flicker. The sinks began to spit water full blast. And the ceiling cords began to swing in circles. You could hear something stomping around the porch. Whispers were coming from every corner of the house and the basement. Doors started to slam, and the famous shadow figures from the catwalk in the basement were back. No matter how many times we apologized, it wouldn't stop. My house had five doors, one on each side and one leading out from the basement. We ran to the front door and it wouldn't open. Something was holding it closed. The only door we were able to get out of was one of the side doors, but it slammed behind us, nearly knocking my friend to the ground. Once we were outside, we could hear something running up on us to the porch. We all dove off the side stairs and into the grass. Whatever was on the porch kept running beside us while we were running for our car in the grass. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. When we jumped in the car and started up the driveway... Something hit the back window so hard I could see a handprint on the glass. We stayed at a friend's house that night, but I don't think either one of us actually slept. The events of that night were truly traumatizing. Reliving now, my heart is pumping so hard because I remember feeling it all. We had to go back to the house eventually, and it was a day we all dreaded. The doors were locked, even though we hadn't locked them. The inside was totally trashed, and there was stuff everywhere. However, the Ouija board didn't look like it had ever moved. It was in the spot we left it, with a single cigarette laying in the middle of the board. The only thing that was different is the whiskey glass that appeared to be on top of the number 7. We quickly grabbed all of our essential items that we needed for the apartment, and left the bigger items for later. I would like to say that we never experienced anything again, but we were all convinced there was a lot of residual activity. The apartment we moved into was a somewhat new complex, and there would just be a lot of odd things that would happen. I first started experiencing sleep paralysis around that time. I would occasionally wake up in the middle of the night to a dark figure standing in my doorway. From that point on, I never felt alone. I've never gone back to the house after I moved my things out. I know it foreclosed, and I believe it was sold during an auction. I have no idea who the new occupants are, 
they were apparently not from the area. However, I still feel such a strong connection to the house. When I visit my hometown, I feel the strong urge to go to it, just to drive past it, but I never do. It haunts my dreams often, and I'm constantly reminded of it and the spirits associated. I scared a bunch of people on night shift. I pre-recorded some murmuring and random words like, Hello, you've made a big mistake, on my phone. Then got a Bluetooth speaker and set it in a room. Why? Because we had planned to play the Ouija board. The place I used to work at was nice. The median age of employees was roughly 23, and it was about 30 of us altogether. All of them were friends, but some of us were mischievous. Pranking each other was a daily routine, and often the CEO and COO were involved. They were always involved after the fact, when everyone laughed at the poor soul who got pranked on. One night, someone suggested we play the Ouija board, and I couldn't pass the opportunity to mess with everyone. The Bluetooth speaker was a tiny one. The only problem was that it had a blue light which would be visible in a dark room. So I put tape over that, and placed it inside an open box and had my cell phone connected. I was one of the biggest skeptics in the office, so if I could act scared it would be very convincing. I used an office iPad to record the event, and everyone was aware of the recording. We sat down and started holding hands, so I couldn't just take out my phone to play the audio. This is where my genius becomes tangible. I had set it up as five minutes of silence before audio started. And five minutes later, the question on the table was, is someone here? And amazingly, a voice came saying, hello? Everyone freaked out. It was just perfect, perfect timing. Then the murmurs started, then a whispering voice said, don't mess with us, followed by numerous murmurs. And then, Mark killed me. He killed me. I had to act freaked out. One slip and I would give it all away. And then a co-worker of mine let go of the hand and fell to the floor. He passed out. We turned on the lights and a few seconds later he came too. We gave him water and calmed him down. Seeing the collective scare on my co-workers and brilliant execution, I thought the best way to honor it would be not to tell them what I did. It's been a few years, and I'm sure there are five guys out there still telling people how they experienced a real ghost killed by someone called Mark. Over 10 years ago, I opened up a portal in my life in which I may never understand or lose. There are still days I feel the presence, and I believe I will be perpetually followed by a manifestation of my actions. Even recently, I began having a weird habit of almost psychosis-like uncontrollable dark thinking. Just go kill yourself, repeated over the course of just a few days in my head last month more than 50 times. This happened for things as large as depressive wallowing or as small as forgetting to do something. I unconsciously formed devil horns with my hands every day. I have a strange obsession with occult imagery and the enlightened eye of Lucifer that you may or may not notice propagated literally everywhere on music. Where's the best place to hide the truth? In plain sight. When I was in high school, I was overweight and drawn to outsider extremist crowds. We wore black. We listened to death metal. We caused as much general mayhem as possible, all the while toting a pack of parliament cigarettes like we were a Ville Valo halfway through his daily fifth of Jack. In these times, there was one group which I grew to like, trust, and ultimately subject my innocence and soul. My friends introduced the Ouija board to me as something they really wanted to delve into. When I was persuaded, we didn't just delve, we dove. I turned away from my Catholic upbringing 
and began to search for evil so that we could translate that to our experience with the board. This was because our first few plays were typical of a new Ouija user's experience. The board moved very little. We questioned who was even moving it in the first place, and we had exhausted our haunted venues. I introduced a satanic mantra to the group, and was welcomed to the table side of my friend Cody's house. We were tired of the effort it took to get into graveyards and abandoned buildings, so his dad's place was going to have to do. We put the board on his kitchen table, huddled around it with our hands on the planchette, and chanted the mantra, Archangel, Dark Angel, lend me thy light, do death's fail until we have heaven in sight. Six times, pause. Six times, pause. What a bad idea. What an ignition of torment. These are the events as followed from our many experiences with the board after that, with the house that we cursed, and what I've dealt with since. The board became a hub of life. No matter who touched it, no matter how light we tried to touch it, the board would speak volumes at a very rapid rate. It would always spell words in their entirety to form whole sentences, correctly in English, and strafe in and out of wonderment and vulgar slandering. For example, the board told me in 2006 that Obama was going to be the President of the United States. This was before any decisions were even made in his own party. It also told me that by 2012, the world would have been destroyed by his actions. It spoke at length about salvation, pointing out certain friends that were likely to die early and suffer, those of faith like myself, and very little of my cohorts were to possibly see salvation if we changed certain aspects of my life, and yes, it laid out our deepest fears of why we wouldn't be able to see heaven on the table for the rest of our friends to read. For example, it told me that I needed to stop with premarital sex or I would have no chance. My biggest worry at the time. How did it know? It also adamantly swore there were friends of mine who were doomed to burn for the rest of eternity, who had no chance of heaven no matter what they did. You see, we knew what we were looking to find, what to talk to, a demon or a well-known entity of evil. From classic Lucifer to Anton Lavi and Aleister Crowley, it manifested in various ways through the board. They told us that the greatest part about hell was being a slave. The worst part about hell was being a slave as well. Cody loved the adrenaline and ended up buying a new board. With this board, we went even further. This is something hard to fess up to and even harder to allude to in a confessional as a Catholic to a respected priest, but I still do in light of my soul and personal beliefs. With the new board, I found a backward recording of the Lord's Prayer and let it rip. Oh, the movement. The board would flip between the answers yes and no, faster than we could stop to think about it. It also became more evil and more malevolent in its answering. One day, we invited over a host of extra friends. They were all friends I knew. We began with the usual, questions it shouldn't know the answer to, flipping it off and watching the board spell back, fuck you. When they had witnessed the power of what we had invoked, a friend named Jordan started to lose his cool. No way this is real. You have to be moving it, he exclaimed in disbelief. Acting like a pompous know-it-all, he took the Bible he had brought for his own peace of mind and plopped it down on the table. Immediately, the planche had sprung into action with one of the most memorable things the board had ever communicated. Take the Bible off the table, or else I'll burn the house down, fuckers. It spelled every letter, and we all went nuts. Of course, the house did not burn down after Jordan refused to remove the Bible, but it has gotten us in other ways. Cody's house became a bona fide place of the strange. Like I said, I had many groups, and this one was full of needy people that mooched off of each other. 
That being said, there was a constant string of people coming and going, passing out on couches and acting like the place was theirs. Cody's dad worked out of town 90% of the time, and that was taken advantage of. One of the kids that always stayed there, who played with us regularly, stopped wanting to be over there because he would constantly see a staunch white face that would glare at him through the windows. Cody saw a little sleep in that house, and would wake up in living nightmares, he said. For example, one sleep he awoke in the mist of the night, 3 a.m. as a real supernatural hour, and felt extremely uneasy. Soon he began to hear haunting moans, which culminated in a mass of hands reaching up and over the bed, as if they were going to grab him and pull him into Hades. A good friend of mine, who I stupidly introduced, had the worst visible reaction of any one of us. We finished a session, and cruising around in my car to rehash the experience. Midway through this, he stops talking to me. I pause for an answer, and in my waiting I hear an odd breathing. He turns out to be basically panting like a dog. I pulled over and got out to go to his side. He was positioned leaning downward in the passenger seat, but also had one arm up and holding the oh shit handle. It was as if he was glued to it, panting and panting. I could only think how strange and stupid this behavior was. When I started to try and help by touching him to get out of the car, he only panted harder. I began to think it couldn't be a joke. This scared the shit out of me, so I drove five minutes across our small town to the Catholic Church. I had no idea what to do, but I had an inkling. I pulled him out of the car and basically spilled him onto the sidewalk of the church, right in front of the statue of the Virgin Mary. He writhed on the pavement, but eventually came to and was extremely disoriented. To this day, I don't know if he was playing a joke on me or if it was real, but it did something to frighten me. In this time, I noticed that I became more withdrawn and spiteful. I hated my classmates, and wanted nothing to do with the popular and liked people in our school. I began to research the occult, and download literature from respected names in evil, such as the aforementioned Alistair, Anton, and H.P. Lovecraft. One day, my mother came down into my room in the basement. She didn't say much, but I could tell she was deeply disconcerted. Whatever it is you brought into my house, take it out now. My dreams have become haunted and evil, and I know that it's been you. I never told her anything of what I was doing, but my actions have begun to cause her deeply uncomforting nightmares. It was right at this time I had my first episode of sleep paralysis. One night I woke up and could not move. I tried to lift an arm, roll over, even scream. I could get my body to respond to nothing. I tried to force all my will and thought into something simple as just moving a pinky. Nothing. This was similar to my further research into typical sleep paralysis experiences others have had. An oppressing feeling. Hearing things. Seeing what's not there. I saw no figures, but I did have an out-of-body, almost lucid dreaming type experience. While I was laying there, I sort of lost touch with reality and my physical body. I remember sitting up, but also being conscious that I had never moved, and that my body was still laying in bed. While sitting, my soul turned towards the doorway to the basement room I lived in. I gazed across the floor to the doorway, where through that should have been a set of seven stairs that led straight up and out of the basement. I couldn't make out the doorway. I couldn't make out the stairs. That area of the room, to me, was a pitch black hole. Like the black cloud of Hermaeus Mora from Skyrim, a moving, breathing black cloud. Around me, the hue of the room was a light twilight-like gray, so it was easy to see that where the doorway should have been was not what was there at all. I felt supreme fear, but I still stared. When I finally turned back to sitting forward and laid down flat, I was suddenly able to move my body again, like someone gasping back to life after receiving CPR. 
I deleted all of the occult literature I had downloaded the next day. Fast forward three years. I'm a teenager at Gonzaga University as a freshman. It was a great time, but to stay relevant, it was also a time I grew to expect haunting nightmares of my own. More than once, I would wake up in my bed as if it were actually me waking up. But immediately, I would notice that the crucifix in the room, which I never even had, would be hanging crooked. Not just awkwardly, but at a hard, almost right angle. I know that a crucifix that doesn't hang straight is an indication of a supernatural presence. I would get up feeling anxious, but wanting to connect with someone else to know what was going on. Whenever I found my friends or loved ones in these dreams, the same occurrence would take place. They would express deep concern for me and approach me to see what was wrong, but when I exposed my face and tried to speak, it would come out as the deepest, most inhuman bellow. Imagine the MGM lion's growl for whatever I was trying to say. When this happened in my dreams, my friends and family would literally fall over themselves in horror trying to get away from me. When I was abandoned and longing, my dream self would be flung to my back and I would experience an unnatural presence in my chest. Whether this is a possessing experience or just part of my nightmares, I don't know but I've had this type of dream at least five times in my life. Throughout the years, I feel a presence that follows me, and it haunts me whenever I turn to God or strive to become involved in a holier lifestyle. There was a climactic time for me in 2014, where all of my past flooded back to become a renewed source of haunting. I accidentally ingested a foot spray that was very toxic in my apartment, and almost passed out from this. I was lightheaded, disoriented, and far from all there, putting me in a very vulnerable state. I was also scared I may pass out and never wake up, so I jumped in the car to get myself to the hospital, come hell or high water. A trip to the hospital meant that I needed my insurance card, which was at work. I remember only feeling hazy on the drive there. For some reason, I swore that card was there, and that I just had to have it for the ER. I pulled up right outside of the building and went into the lobby to call the elevator. At the time, I worked for one of the largest real estate firms in the state as an agent. My broker was a micromanaging freak, so the office was made up of many offices in one large space. The catch was that each individual office was made up of all glass walls. Our broker just had to be able to make sure everyone was always working. What that meant for me during my delusional visit was that the office was full of bright lights from passing cars on the road, twinkling like a kaleidoscope setting in the right light. This was extremely disconcerting. I found my desk almost frightened from the silent twinkling office and dug through where I thought I had my card. It wasn't there. Could I have doubted myself and left it in my car this whole time? Around the time I had this revelation, I felt a most threatening presence growing behind me in the corner of the room. I turned just in time to see a mass of unstoppable black which seemed to be growing to envelop my body. I had a feeling of hate directed towards me. I tripped over myself out of the office. I didn't shut any of the doors, my desk, the hall, the exit, and ran out. I knew the front door locked itself so I didn't even need to think twice about it. The last thing I heard on the way out was the hall door upstairs clicking innocently shut. I made it to the hospital and was nursed back to health. At this same time, my romantic long-distance relationship went sour. I knew she was going behind my back, and this caused a huge part of our downfall. But another portion came from what she claimed to hear and feel. She was more than a hundred miles away, but was haunted by dragging sounds outside her room and an evil presence inside the house. One night she called me and asked if I were home. I was at home myself, far away. She was freaking out about the dragging sound in her living room, which I couldn't claim responsibility for or explain. She was talking to me when all of a sudden I lost her on the other end of the phone. I could still hear her breathing, but she disappeared for minutes. Then she was back, 
whimpering and had gone long enough to freak me out. She even went as far as to have the house blessed with sage by a medium. This was completely against my Catholic upbringing, and it almost killed my cat because of how outlandishly he reacted, trying to exit the house through a screen window during the process that was five feet in the air. The medium, in their first encounter, told her that I'm haunted because of what I'd done in my past. I had never told her about my Ouija experience before. She was extremely judgmental and close-minded. From that experience, she came to me asking questions about things she had no business knowing, like satanic music that had taken its toll, that there was a certain lyric that I had heard that had brought this upon me. I knew instantly what it was, our satanic mantra. I still try to make it to church. I'm in a relationship in which I'm in love now. And none of this matters because I'm supported and feel strength in many aspects. I still confess to my Ouija use in the confessional and wish for it to go away. Will it return again to haunt me? It's hard to deny a trend of darkness, even through the greatest efforts to return to the light. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's narrations, and of course, a huge thank you to Blue Spooky for his help in narrating this video. If you liked his work, feel free to check out his channel. The link, as I mentioned at the start, is in the description and will appear shortly on the cards that appear on screen. I'd like to give also a huge thanks to my wonderful patrons for their continued support and donations, as it really does mean a lot. If you'd like to donate and or become a patron, you can find the information in the description. It helps out a lot, and you get access to some cool stuff for signing up. So think about it. Link in the description. But anyway, for now guys, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.